Hello friends and welcome to the Sabbath School Study. The lesson this week focuses on how Paul teaches the Ephesians and us to count our blessings. Not the blessings we think are important, but the real blessings humanity needs so desperately. God, Paul, emphasizes, gives these blessings to us in Christ. In Christ, we have been chosen and accepted by God. We are his and he is ours. God treasures and regards us as his inheritance and we treasure and regard him as our inheritance. In Christ, we have been forgiven and redeemed. In Christ, we receive God's supreme plan of salvation. In Christ, humanity has its only chance at unity and harmony. In Christ, we live full of joy and praise. Because of Christ, we receive God's seal and a foretaste of eternal salvation. Because of Christ, we may receive the presence and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God's gifts are spiritual, primarily in the sense that the Holy Spirit gives them to us. The Holy Spirit brings these gifts to us from the very realms of heaven. All these riches are God's gifts to us all because we do not know and cannot work to merit them. It is God who gives these gifts to us freely out of his heart full of love for us. All who accept these gifts, God predestines to be sealed and to taste beforehand the eternal blessings of his kingdom. Before we could get into the study, let us all pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful topic that you have given us, Father. We pray that as we go through this study, that we will be able to understand, comprehend, and experience the real blessings, the spiritual blessings that you are bestowing upon us from your throne of grace. Help us to understand its importance, Father, and may that fill us with love for you in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Ephesians, we see use of heavenly places and heaven in many verses. Um, what does the phrase in heavenly places mean? In Ephesians, the phrases in heavenly places and in the heavens or in heaven point to heaven as the dwelling place of God, to the location of spiritual powers and to the location of Christ's exaltation at the right hand of the Father. Believers have access. I, I would like to re repeat that again. Believers have access to these heavenly places in the present as a sphere where spiritual blessings are offered through Christ. Though the heavenly places have become a place of blessing for believers, they are still the location of conflict from evil powers that contest the lordship of Christ. So therefore, Paul's heavenly places are not some ethereal neoplatonic spheres describing the immaterial divine world to which our incorporeal disembodied spirit allegedly travels after death. Considering the larger biblical context, the notion of heavenly places is a very rich biblical concept. On the one hand, the heavens refers to the entire universe that God created with all of its magnificent beauty. On the other hand, the apostle relates the heavenly places with creation and salvation. When God created the universe, he did not remain outside the universe. Rather, God chose to enter the universe as its creator, provider, and king, and to establish a special personal relationship with the beings he created in his image. This relationship is accomplished in various ways. One, in his only presence, God was and is present throughout the universe. This idea means that we can pray to God everywhere, in any situation, and he hears us in real time. We see in Ephesians 1.4, which says that we have been chosen in him. 
Christ before the foundation of the world. What does before the foundation mean? And how does it reveal to us God's love for us and his desire for us to be saved? The author gives a wonderful illustration here. In the past, numerous people died from accidental domestic electrocution. Modern houses are equipped with an ingenious protective device called a ground fault circuit interrupter. The GFCIs sense any difference in the current in the system and interrupt the electrical current in a matter of milliseconds. In this way, if a child plugs a metallic object into an outlet, the circuit interrupter will activate and stop the current and save the child from death. God planned to create our world and crown it with intelligent and free humans who would choose to reject God in sin. The consequences of sinning, like the consequences of touching a live electrical wire, results in the death of the sinner. So according to Paul, before the foundation of the world, God built into creation plan a safety feature, a spiritual GFCI, that is GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupter. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, they were supposed to die because they touched the bare wire of sin. However, Adam and Eve did not die immediately because the plan of salvation just as how the GFCI works in milliseconds, the plan of salvation created by God before the foundation of the world was immediately activated. That plan was Christ. And whoever believes in Christ, whoever chooses to be found in Christ is saved from the power and consequences of sin, guilt, alienation, and death. Prophet tells us in Desire of Ages, paragraphs 25 and 26, by his life and his death, Christ has achieved more than recovery from the ruin brought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man, but in Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fought. This, this has to say, just leave it to all of us to think and comprehend of how much love God has with us. That you know, even though after separating from him, after committing a sin, when we go back to him, we become closer to him than ever before. That's so wonderful. It says more about how much God loves us. As we are looking at spiritual blessings, we see that it comes from the heavenly places. The first blessing is that we have access to God's throne room, even though we are here on this earth. And second of all, we saw how God made this plan activate immediately. Immediately when we sin and we go back to him, there is, uh, there is mercy, there is redemption for us. So what is redemption? Redemption is an idea that is used frequently in the New Testament. And we are going to look about this in detail. The Greek word translated redemption in Ephesians 1.7 is apulotrosis, originally used for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free a captive. One can hear the echoed voice of the slave trader auctioning his merchandise and the cold grinding of slaves' manner goes. When the New Testament discusses redemption, it highlights the costliness of setting the slaves free. Our freedom comes at an extreme cost. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Ephesians 1 7. The idea of redemption also celebrates God's gracious generosity in paying the high price of our liberty. God gives us our freedom and dignity. We are no longer enslaved. Let us look at how important is the redemption to be the topic of our study and our reflection every single day. From the spirit of prophecy, upward look, paragraph 219, the prophet says, I wish I could present this matter before our people just as I view it. The great 
offering made in behalf of man. Justice asked for the sufferings of a man. Christ, equal with God, gave the sufferings of a God. He needed no atonement himself. It was for man, all for man. His depth of agony was proportionate to the dignity and grandeur of his character. Never shall we see and comprehend the intense anguish of the sufferings of the spotless Lamb of God until we feel how deep is the dip pit from which we have been delivered, how grievous the sin of which humanity is guilty, and by faith grasp the full and entire pardon. Here is where thousands are failing. They do not really believe that Jesus pardons them individually. They fail to take God at his word. He has assured us that he is faithful, that had promised to forgive us and be just to his own law. His mercy is not wanting in anything. Where there one defective link in the chain, then we are hopelessly ruined in our sin. There is not one flaw in it, not one missing link. Oh, precious redemption, why do we not bring this great truth more fully into our lives? How broad it is that God, for Christ's sake, forgives us, me, even me, the moment we ask him to, in living faith, believing that he is fully able to do this. By redemption, God is uniting us in Christ. God begins his plan to unify all things rooted in the death, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation of Jesus by founding the church and unifying disparate elements of humankind, Jews and Gentiles in it. The author has beautifully given us to why this unity is required and what does it say? Listen to this powerful statement. In this way, it is by unifying the church and unifying us with Christ. The church signals to the evil powers that God's plan is underway and their divisive rule will end. The last half of Paul's letter opens with a passionate call to unity and continues with a lengthy exhortation to avoid behavior that damages unity and instead to build solidarity with fellow believers. Paul concludes with the rousing image of the church as a unified army participating with vigor in waging peace in Christ's name. I'd like to read a quotation from Bible Commentary, Volume 6 and Paragraph 1090. Listen to what Prophet Ellen has to say. The man who's truly united with Christ will never act as though he were a complete whole in himself. The perfection of the church depends not on each member being fashioned exactly alike. God calls for each one to take his proper place, to stand in his lot, to do his appointed work according to the ability which has been given him. By virtue of the death of Jesus and by uniting with him, Christian have, Christians have received an inheritance from God and become an inheritance to God as a central element in their Christian identity. Paul wishes believers and us believers then and believers now to know our value to God. Prophet says wonderfully in steps to Christ, notice of how much value we are to heaven. The soul redeemed and cleansed from sin with all its noble powers dedicated to the service of God is of surpassing worth and there is joy in heaven in the presence of God and the holy angels over one soul redeemed, a joy that is expressed in songs of holy triumph. Steps to Christ, paragraph 125 and 126. We not only possess an inheritance from God, but we are God's inheritance. And by inheriting us, the, the, the greatest gift that we are receiving, the greatest blessing, this 
spiritual blessing that is coming from the presence of God, in the throne room of God in heaven. The heavenly places is the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The presence of Holy Spirit in the lives of believers marks as belonging to God and conveys God's promise to protect them. They have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Paul plainly states that at the moment, one gives his or her life to Jesus and believes in him, the Holy Spirit seals that believer in Christ for the day of redemption. Wonderful, liberating, and reassuring truth. The Spirit of God marks Christ's followers with the seal of salvation right when they first believe. The treasured presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, says Paul, is a first installment of the full inheritance of salvation and redemption that will come with the return of Christ. We are to be distinguished from the world because God has placed his seal upon us because he manifests his own character of love. There's a quotation that I'd like to read from Acts of the Apostles. God can use I would like to repeat that sentence again. We are to be distinguished from the world because God has placed a seal upon us and that's the Holy Spirit because he manifests in us his own character of love, God's own character of love. This is something we need to reflect. That should be, should be manifested in the last days to others. God can use every person just in proportion as he can put his spirit into the soul temple. The work that he will accept is the work that reflects his image. Amen. This quotation was taken from Ministry of Healing, paragraph 37. In Acts of the Apostles, paragraph 52, we see God can use every person just in proportion Sorry, the spirit is given as a regenerating agency to make effectual the salvation brought by the death of our Redeemer. The spirit is constantly seeking to draw the attention of men to the great offering that was made on the cross of Calvary, to unfold to the world the love of God and to open to the convicted soul the precious things of the scriptures. Having brought conviction of sin and presented before the mind the standard of righteousness, the Holy Spirit withdraws the affection from the things of this earth and fills the soul with the desire for holiness. If men are willing to be molded, there will be brought about a sanctification of the whole being. The Spirit will take the things of God and stamp them on the soul. By his power, the way of life will be made so plain that none need err therein. Listen to what Prophet says in Testimonies for Church, Volume 9, in page 40. God desires, God desires to refresh his people by the gift of the Holy Spirit, baptizing them anew in his love. There is no need for a dearth of the Spirit in the church. After Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit came upon the waiting, praying, believing disciples with the fullness and power that reached every heart. In the future, the earth is to be enlightened with the glory of God. A holy influence is to go forth to the world from those who are sanctified through the truth. The earth is to be encircled with an atmosphere of grace. The Holy Spirit is to work on human hearts, taking the things of God and showing them to men. Friends, so many blessings which cannot even be comprehended is what God has blessed us with. And yet we feel, and, and it's so difficult for us to part with the world and with the worldly things because we think it's a big sacrifice when we try to part with the world and when we try to get in to God, when we give up on so many things, Many a times we boast, we do boast in ourselves telling that we have given up on this thing, we've given up on that, we've sacrificed this. Listen to what the prophet has to say in our high calling in paragraph 201. Christians sometimes think they have a hard time. 
that the road seems hard and that they may have many sacrifices to make, but in reality, they make no sacrifice at all. If in reality, they are adopted into the family of God, sacrifice have they made. Their following Christ may have broken some friendship with their well-loving relatives and well-loving pleasures and worldly affections, but look at the exchange. Their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, elevated, yes, greatly exalted to be partakers of salvation, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ to an imperishable inheritance. If there is anyone who should be continually grateful, it is the follower of Christ. If we appreciate or have any sense of how dearly our salvation was purchased, anything which we may call sacrifice will sink away into insignificance. Friends, as we study the book of Ephesians, let us earnestly and sincerely pray that we will start experiencing these spiritual blessings. Let us ask God that he will give us the understanding, that he will help us experience how important these spiritual blessings are. Let us close with a prayer. Father in heaven, dear God, thank you first of all for hearing us. Father, thank you for helping us know that you're right here and that you are in front of us and we are praying and we are talking to you. Thank you for such wonderful opportunity creator of the entire universe, Father, you have stepped in. You are here with us. You are listening to us. And we praise and thank you for that. Thank you for this numerous blessings. Thank you for helping us see it. Thank you for this wonderful study. Thank you for your unconditional love, which we do not deserve. Father, help us day by day to experience your love more and more. The countless blessings help us open our eyes to those countless blessings that you have, you have bestowed upon us and you are bestowing upon us. And may that touch, change our hearts and swell our hearts with love for you. And make us people, sons and daughters of God, where your love can be manifested to the world in the last days. Take us and use us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and seal us, Father, as your sons and daughters we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining, friends, and see you again in the next time.